Hi everyone. This video is about microevolutionary processes. In class, we've been learning how to track allele frequencies to determine if a population is changing over time, or rather, if it's evolving. This video is an overview of the processes that cause those changes to occur. Let's start by reviewing the concept of microevolution. Microevolution refers to change in a population's allele frequencies over short time periods. To illustrate, here we have a small population of organisms with two color phenotypes, the big B allele codes for blue and the little b allele codes for orange. In this generation, we see that 60% of the color alleles are blue and 40% are orange. If we follow this population to the next generation, we see that now 50% of the alleles code for blue and 50% of the alleles code for orange. Since the allele frequencies in this population changed from one generation to the next, the population is evolving. If we want to know what's causing this, we need to learn about microevolutionary processes. These are the processes and events that cause allele frequencies to change. And there are six different microevolutionary processes that you need to know. Natural selection, artificial selection, sexual selection, genetic drift, gene flow, and mutation. In this video, we'll define and explain each one. But before we get into that, we need to go over the concept of selective versus random processes. Some of the microevolutionary processes we're going to be learning about are selective and others are random. You already know what random means, so let's take a closer look at this idea of selective. An evolutionary process is considered selective if survival and reproduction depend on an organism's phenotype, or rather if specific phenotypes are more advantageous for survival and reproduction. Let's take a look at these sheep on the right. If individuals with shorter fleece consistently survive and reproduce more than individuals with thicker, longer fleece, we would say that the population is experiencing a selective process in which shorter fleece is more advantageous. Once we determine that a process is selective, there's a couple more things you need to be able to identify. First of all, what is selection based on? For example, does having shorter fleece make these sheep better adapted to their natural environment? Or is it perhaps more attractive to potential mates? And then you'll also need to be able to tell what is the selective force, or rather, what causes one phenotype to be more advantageous than another. We'll go over these ideas more as we discuss each microevolutionary process. The first microevolutionary process that we're going to learn about is natural selection, also known as survival of the fittest. And the way that it works is that individuals who are best adapted to the challenges of their specific natural environment will survive best and reproduce the most. To illustrate, here we have a population of mice. You can see they're not all identical to each other. There is variation between individuals, and this is something we assume to be true about all natural populations. Now, the specific challenge that these mice face in their natural environment is a predator. This is a hawk, and it's a visual predator catching and killing the mice that it can see most easily. Now, you can tell here that some of the mice are going to camouflage better, but those white mice are going to be more visible to the hawk, so they're more likely to get caught and killed. But the brown mice camouflage better, so they're more likely to survive and reproduce, passing on the alleles that code for that brown coat color. So if we come back and look at this population again in a couple of generations, we would see that there are fewer of the light colored mice and more of the dark colored mice. So the result of natural selection is an increased frequency of alleles coding for traits that increase chances of survival. Natural selection is a selective process since survival and reproduction are dependent on phenotype. And here the selection is based on fitness. But this word fitness has a very different definition in biology and evolution as compared to standard cultural definition. It's not just like how strong you are and how many sit-ups you can do. But in biology, it refers to how well adapted organisms are for the specific environmental pressures they face. So it could be things like competition for resources, predators, climate, disease, etc. And these are the selective forces that favor one phenotype over another. So in the situation depicted here, the selective force is the hawk because it's a visual predator and catches the mice that are less camouflaged. What else do you need to know about natural selection? One really important thing to know is that natural selection is not directed or goal oriented. It's not intentionally moving towards some theoretical ideal because there is no universally ideal organism. And this is because fitness or what it means to be fit is different depending on the organism and its environment where you go in the world. So for example, 
if an organism lives in the Arctic, ideal fitness may be defined by a very pale color and having lots of insulation and fur and being able to swim. Whereas in the desert, ideal fitness might be defined by a, a totally different color for blending into the environment, a long thin body without any fur or fat and no ability to swim. So it, it depends on the organism and where it lives. Also, Natural selection is the only evolutionary process that consistently leads to adaptive change or increased fitness. And this means that populations undergoing natural selection consistently become better adapted to their natural environment over time. The second microevolutionary process is artificial selection, also known as selective breeding. And the way that this works is that some outside force, usually humans, chooses which individuals get to survive and reproduce in a population. To illustrate, here we have a small population of dogs, and once again, you can see that there's variation between individuals. Now, maybe you really like dogs with shorter legs and long bodies. So you select the individuals in the population that have the shortest legs and the longest bodies, and you breed them together because you wanna have more dogs with the short legs and the long bodies. So this is an example of non-random mating, where mating in the population is determined by the phenotype or some outside force. Now, if we were to come back in a couple of generations and look at this dog population after you've been doing this selective breeding, we would see that more individuals in the population have shorter legs and longer bodies. We sort of shifted the population towards that phenotype. And we do this with many other organisms. For example, we breed racehorses to run faster, and we breed farm animals to produce more meat or milk, and we breed crops to produce bigger or sweeter fruit. In every case, the result of artificial selection is an increased frequency of alleles that code for the preferred traits of whoever or whatever is deciding who gets to mate. Because reproductive success depends on phenotype, artificial selection is a selective process, and selection here is based on specific phenotype goals. The selective force is the preference for a specific phenotype. So in the situation shown here, the selective force would be the human preference for dogs with short legs and longer bodies. Unlike natural selection, artificial selection does not consistently lead to adaptive change. So populations undergoing artificial selection do not necessarily become better adapted to their natural environment. In fact, artificial selection can sometimes encourage maladaptive traits, and that prefix mal means bad. This means it can increase the frequency of alleles or traits that would actually reduce fitness in a natural environment. For example, if we take a look at this English bulldog. Selective breeding over many years for this cute squished face has re resulted in breeding problems that would make it very difficult for bulldogs to chase prey or outrun a predator in a natural environment. Selective breeding for chickens over many decades to produce more meat and grow faster has resulted in populations of birds that can barely stand up on their own, so they definitely wouldn't be able to escape from a predator if placed in a natural environment. The third microevolutionary process is sexual selection. In this process, individuals choose their mates based on specific traits or behaviors. For example, individuals might choose to mate with the antelope that wins the most fights, or a bird with the brightest colors or the most complex song. A classic example is the peacock, in which males have huge tails with iridescent blue and green colors and lots of eye spots, but they're not all the same. In a population of peacocks, there is variation between individuals. When females are deciding who to mate with, they usually choose males with more eye spots. So sexual selection is another example of non-random mating. This means that the males who have the most eye spots will generally have the most offspring and pass on the alleles coding for lots of eye spots. Over time, males in the population will have more and more eye spots. So in sexual selection, we generally see increased frequency of the alleles that improve an organism's chances of mating. Because reproductive success is based on phenotype, sexual selection is a selective process. And selection here is based on attractiveness of individuals to the opposite sex. And the selective force is one sex's preference for certain traits in the opposite sex. So in the situation shown here, the selective force is the female's preference for peacock tails with lots of eye spots. Unlike natural selection, sexual selection does not consistently lead to adaptive change or increased fitness. And like artificial selection, sexual selection can actually encourage maladaptive traits that decrease an individual's chance of survival in its natural environment. How? Well, it requires extra energy to make a huge tail or sing a complicated song or produce brightly colored pigments, energy that might otherwise be used for finding food or surviving a cold winter. Also, traits and behaviors that females prefer may make males more susceptible to predation. 
for example, Mr. Peacock down here on the bottom, you can see he's got this massive tail. It's all folded up here, and that's really heavy, and it's going to make it more difficult to fly away from predators. In other types of birds, the males often have brighter colors or more striking color patterns, and these make them less able to camouflage in their natural environment. The fourth microevolutionary process is genetic drift, and this refers to change in a population's allele frequencies due to chance events. So this process is random, it is not selective. And there are two types of genetic drift. The first one is a population bottleneck, in which there is a drastic reduction in a population size due to a chance event. So due to something like a natural disaster, say a fire or a tsunami. And survival is based completely on chance. It has nothing to do with fitness or phenotype. And we call it a bottleneck based on the metaphor of the population getting squeezed through the narrow neck of a bottle with only a few individuals making it through and surviving. To illustrate, here we have a small population of organisms with two color phenotypes, a peachy color and a green, and you can see that there's a higher frequency of the alleles coding for the peachy color in this generation. Now something terrible happens and this population uh, gets exposed to a random chance event and it just wipes out a good chunk of the population and survival has nothing to do with phenotype or fitness it's just who was in the wrong place at the wrong time and we can see now that we have a smaller gene pool fewer alleles in the population and the allele frequencies are different from the original population in the surviving population here we have a higher frequency of the green allele and if we were to follow this to the next generation we'd see that that change might persist so that's a population bottleneck the second type of genetic drift is the founder effect, in which an individual or small group of individuals starts a new population in a new location. So it could be a few individuals migrating to a new location or traveling to an island where there weren't previously any members of that species. And the result is a smaller gene pool in that new population, and allele frequencies may be different from the original population as a result. In the example shown here, we see that there are approximately equal numbers of red and purple dots in this larger original population, but when a few of them migrate to a new location to start a new population, there are more of the red individuals, so the allele frequencies are different from the original population. And again, this is a random process. The migration here had nothing to do with phenotype or fitness. In both types of genetic drift, population bottlenecks and the founder effect, the reduction in a population's size and gene pool results in a shift in allele frequencies. The fifth microevolutionary process is gene flow, which refers to immigration or emigration between populations. And what this means genetically is that alleles are moving into or out of populations via fertile individuals or gametes. For example, here we have two populations of beetles, one of them brown and one of them green. And what we see here is one brown beetle migrating into the existing population of green beetles. And when it does that, it's introducing an allele that wasn't already in the green beetle population. Now this is different from the founder effect because alleles are just being transferred between established populations. Gene flow does not involve starting a completely new population. And this process can occur even if an organism cannot move. If just its gametes can travel to a new population, they can introduce an allele that wasn't there before. For example, pine trees cannot move, but they can release their pollen into the air, and pollen is just plant sperm. And if the wind is strong enough, it might go to a different population, take that sperm to a different population of pine trees that didn't previously have some of those alleles, so introducing new alleles that way. It happens in the ocean too. Corals cannot move, but they can release their eggs and sperm into the water. And if the current is strong enough, it might take some of those alleles to another population that didn't previously have those. So moving alleles between populations. Now, since this transfer of alleles is not determined by phenotype or fitness, gene flow is a random process. It is not selective. The sixth and final microevolutionary process that you need to know is mutation. And the way that this works is a random change in DNA creates a brand new allele, which can result in a new phenotype. And the addition of this new allele can change a population's allele frequencies. If we revisit our population of green and peach dots, we see that in this generation, we have slightly more of the green dots, slightly fewer of the peach dots, so we could figure out the allele frequencies, but then something interesting happens, and in the next generation, there is a completely new allele that has never been seen before. We have this new purple color there. And the introduction of this new allele will shift the allele frequencies in that population because now we've got something added to the numbers. It's really important to know about mutation that this is the only microevolutionary process that can create totally new alleles and phenotypes. This is different from gene flow because the allele is not just coming in from another population. It's spontaneous creation of something completely new. And this process, mutation, is random. It is not selective. 
but it can produce new phenotypes that are later subject to selective processes. For example, maybe this new purple allele will make individuals less able to camouflage, so they more be, may be more subject to natural selection via predation. Or perhaps females in the population really like the purple color, so the frequency of the purple allele may increase due to sexual selection. Either way, the initial introduction of the new allele via mutation is random. So those are all six of the microevolutionary processes that you need to know. One thing that is important to note is that most populations in nature are undergoing several of these processes at any given time. Another way to look at it is in order for a population not to evolve, it must experience no changes in allele frequencies. If we were to graph allele frequencies, it might just be straight lines like we see here on the right. But in order for this to happen, we'd have to have no selective processes taking place in the population. So no natural selection, no artificial selection, no sexual selection, no mutations bringing in brand new alleles, no migration of individuals into or out of populations, so no shifting of alleles between populations, a large population size, so that little random changes don't shift the allele frequencies, and random mating, so no artificial selection, no sexual selection. Now, it's really unlikely for all of these things to happen in nature at the same time, so most populations in nature are always evolving in one way or another. To wrap it up, let's summarize the main points from this video and what you need to know. To summarize, you need to know that microevolutionary processes cause shifts in a population's allele frequencies, and that these processes can be selective or random. For selective processes, it's important to know that they select for or against phenotypes. In our population of mice, for example, homozygous dominant individuals have the same phenotype as heterozygous individuals, but increased survival is due to the brown phenotype that helps these mice camouflage, not their specific genotype. You also need to know what the six microevolutionary processes are and how each one works. For each of the six processes, you should know whether it's selective or random. And if selective, you should be able to explain what selection is based on and what the selective force is. You should also be able to explain whether each microevolutionary process consistently results in adaptive change or increased fitness. Finally, you should know that in order to not evolve, a population must not experience any of these microevolutionary processes, and that this is very unlikely in nature. Most populations are constantly evolving. Okay, that's all for now. Until next time, take care of yourself and take care of each other.